This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Jonathan, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Hey, Bob. It's good to be back with you. So, folks, we are going to be tackling yet two more of Robert Reich's alleged economic myths in this episode. But before we do, just want to give a plug. Remember, the Mises Institute is having its Supporters Summit in Hilton Head this year. So it's a weekend of engaging talks, networking, and celebration at the 2024 Mises Institute Supporters Summit, again being held in Hilton Head, South Carolina. It's featuring presentations from Lou Rockwell, Tom Woods, me, Peter Klein, Tom DiLorenzo, and many more. And it takes place October 10th through 12th. Registration is currently open for Mises members if you go to mises.org slash SS24. Okay, so returning now to the the fun stuff here, or the even more fun stuff, dissecting Robert Reich. Again, we're going through two myths. I think, why don't we, uh, folks, just, we'll, we'll play each one, and then, you know, Jonathan and I will react to it. So here we go. This first one has to do with wealth and income. Get ready for this lie. The richest people have worked the hardest and therefore deserve their wealth. Bunk. Income and wealth increasingly depend on who has the power to set the rules of the game. CEOs of large corporations and Wall Street's top traders effectively set their own pay. And their pay has gone into the stratosphere. They've linked their pay to the stock market through stock options, used corporate stock buybacks to increase stock prices, and timed the sale of their options to those increases. Some get inside information about corporate profits and losses before the rest of the public and trade on that information. Others create or work for companies that have monopolized their markets. That means they can charge consumers higher prices than if they had to compete for those consumers. And they can keep wages low because workers have fewer options of whom to work for. Others use their political influence to get changes in laws, regulations, and taxes that benefit themselves and their corporations while harming those who don't have this kind of influence. Others were just lucky enough to be born into or marry into wealth. These days, the most important predictor of someone's future income and wealth in the United States is the income and wealth of their parents. 60% of all wealth is inherited. Okay, so again, we just played a, a excerpt from that. So right off the bat, uh, my first reaction to that, Jonathan, is that uh, it's he he's saying that oh, you know, in his caricature of the you know snooty right wing apologist, saying the rich people work harder. That's, I mean, that might be like a a thing an AM talk radio host might say, or you know, Sean Hannity might say, or something, but. That's not something like a libertarian free market economist ever says. That, oh, the reason the rich quote deserve their high incomes is because they work harder than other people. That like that's not something I've ever said. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. So uh, at least among economists, uh, nobody ever really talks like that. People don't use that sort of language when they're describing the sources of income and returns. Um, so just from like the Austrian school perspective. Like there are different returns for for different functions that people uh, play in the market and perform in the market. Uh, the, the types of things that he's thinking about is probably entrepreneurship. And so for the entrepreneur, the return is based on you know correctly guessing what consumers want, investing and uh, appraising factors of production and arranging factors of production in a way that is producing things that everybody wants which has nothing to do with how hard they work, like how much they sweat when they're making those decisions or something like that. So, so you're exactly right. It's, it's very much a straw man from, from that perspective. I mean, what's ironic is if anything, that's like a crude version of the labor theory of value, which is a, a Marxist thing. So far from, oh yeah, the apologist for capitalism saying, you know, that, I, I mean, I suppose the link is that, Reich would say, no, the Marxists, everyone agrees that the harder you work, the more you should get paid. And the Marxists just say, yeah, right. So it should go to the, to the workers and the capitalist stooges are lying when they say the rich work harder than, you know, the blue collar worker. And that, 
So, but they feel so anyway, maybe that's the, the way he would try to reconcile that. But yeah, to be clear for the record, as Jonathan is confirming here, the message we teach our students, for example, is not in a market economy. The people who get paid more tend to be harder workers than the ones who get paid less. And that's why it's kind of fair if you think about it. Like that's not what we, what the claim is, is that you get paid according to the the marginal output or contribution of your efforts. And so that, you know, that's a, a true statement about, you know, the way free market economists talk. And I guess we can unpack that a bit. So just, you know, for example, if some trained plumber makes more per hour than someone on a can, you know, out on the road, just, just shoveling stuff onto the, onto the you know, tar or something in the hot sun. And there's a sense in which the guy working indoors is, probably prefers that than sweating out in the sun or working in a warehouse somewhere and just moving boxes around. Even if one job is, you know, more physically demanding than the other. And the reason is because the skilled carpenter or plumber, whoever is providing something that on the margin is more valuable. And so that's why it it gets rewarded more. I mean, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Jonathan. Well, yeah, I mean, the only thing else to say is that it's it's based on the subjective value of their of their output. So, so if somebody has earned uh, something on the market, it means that somebody has has uh, said that they're willing to pay for that product. They're willing to wait. They're willing to pay for the services of that individual, uh, whatever it is. They're they're willing to pay the the capital owner for the use of the of the machine or or whatever the capital good is. So it's all all the value, all of the income that's earned is based on the prices that people are willing to pay for the the thing that the person is selling on the market. So there there's no there's no necessary connection between effort and income. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. He's he's probably operating under the the labor theory of value framework and and then using that as a basis for for saying that all all the money that these these rich people who are um, they're doing nothing productive. They're just, you know, moving paper around and shouting orders at their at their workers. Uh, that they they don't really earn it in the sense that they're not working as hard as as everybody else. And and that's because they're thinking in terms of labor. They're thinking in terms of like effort in the production process. And so they would they would say that they don't deserve it because they haven't put in the effort. And maybe to unpack some more of this too, just to make sure to avoid confusion, also to give people a deeper understanding of how markets work and employee compensation occurs and so on. Uh, like a, a, a popular example is, Oh wow. A pitcher in the major leagues makes millions of dollars a year, depending on who it is. Whereas a school teacher doesn't. And gee, doesn't that kind of show that our society is messed up that if you think about it, you know, education is far more important than throwing a little white ball around and hitting it with a wooden stick. So really, Shouldn't p- teachers get paid more? And so the the fallacy there, I mean, even if we agree that, yeah, I think most people would say in the aggregate, if you had to choose and say our society is either going to produce all, you know, just education and no baseball services or just baseball services and no education, you know, or schooling, you know, most people would probably say the schooling, some might not. And, you know, we can't prove that they're wrong, but that's not the choice we face. And And specifically the difference is, Lots of people are capable of teaching fifth grade. Okay. It it doesn't mean the people who end up becoming fifth grade teachers are useless or something, or they're no big deal or they're not important, but just saying lots of people could with the right, you know, training and, and so forth go into that. Whereas most people cannot be a pitcher for a major league team. You just, you just can't do it. it. Doesn't matter how much you, you worked at it. it. Just it's not. But and then even among the ones who biologically can do it, they do have to work at it and and so on to get to that level of uh, performance. And so that's why on the margin, a major league pitcher. If if suddenly if a major league pitcher drops out of a heart attack, on the margin, society's output goes down more than if the same thing happens to a teacher, because if we want to, we can just rearrange the labor force to replace the teacher more easily than the major league pitcher. And that that's, that's what we mean. And, and that kind of, you know, goes through too, like with the, you know, the Beatles or something, you say, Oh, like, you know, who's the most important Beatle? That's hard to say, but certainly the guy who like plugs in their amps and stuff when they're getting set up for their concert is not as important as Paul McCartney. 
but there's a sense in which, well, gee, if that guy didn't plug in their amps, nobody would be able to hear him. So isn't he just, and no, because lots of people can do the plug in the amps, whereas not as many people can be the, the stars, right? So there's the same kind of logic just, you know, that applies, applies more generally. It's, and, I, and the reason I say that, John, is because I think some people have this notion of, well, gee, I mean, the people that actually make the cars are the ones on the assembly line, you know, putting the pieces together. The guy, you know, the the management sitting in the nice air conditioned office buildings making decisions about where should we put the next auto plant and you know should we merge with this other distribution channel and should we borrow it on these terms from these potential lenders, people buying our bonds. You know, those decisions, you know, they're actually making the cars the way the workers are. So that's why the worker, you know, I say who who should get the lion's share of the benefits from making those cars? It's the workers who do the real work. But but again, it depending, you know, and, and even there, like there's various levels of skill and some people have very particular skill sets and they do get highly compensated because of that. But if it's just, you know, somebody who's sweeping the floors in the plant that's making the cars, that guy's not getting paid as much as the corporate executive in that same company and for the same kind of reasons that we've been going over here. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out that um, there's a there's a certain level of arrogance in Reich's um, videos because the I mean these are things that economists have been talking about and explaining for over a century now uh, if not uh, probably longer uh, j- just trying to explain like, production and distribution uh, questions and and like why people earn the money that they do for for selling their services or selling the goods that they have on the market and so it, it's the reason I say it's arrogant is because he's got like these it's like two or three minute videos. And really, they're they're not very deep at all. So it's not like he's like packing a bunch of like deep theoretical, high level economic analysis in a very short amount of time. It's like it's they're brief videos on these subjects that have been discussed for a long time in economics. And it's also it's like very high level. It's they're they're you can tell they're meant to appeal to to like people's emotions. Is like yeah, people. People do need uh, to earn their fair share, and those rich people, they definitely don't deserve their wealth. So that, that's just sort of the impression that I get when I'm watching these videos. It's like, it's like, it's like, come on! It's like we, we we've covered this, <laughs> mm-hmm. we've covered this fully. Like, um, you could fill a library full of books that have been written about these questions, and to think that you can just sort of settle it with a, a two to three minute video is with you know cartoons is it seems sort of silly to me. Uh, one one other thing, so so that that obvious that comment I just made was very negative for Reich, but like one positive thing that I can say is I I do agree with them that there there are we can definitely point to certain cases where there's unearned wealth, unearned income in the United States, right? So so it it would be uh, it wouldn't be right for us to say oh, we've got the the unhampered market economy all figured out. People earn their incomes based on the discounted marginal revenue product. Uh, without acknowledging the fact that, like, we live in the real world where there's all sorts of, you know, government interventions, all sorts of things that are um, you know, distorting the market that I do think lead to the same sorts of phenomena that Reich is talking about. So like one, one very clear example is Cantillon effects. And I mentioned this in an article that I wrote in response. So, uh, so I wrote a response that was sort of based on like the last three videos that he did, um, the myths um, three, four, and five. And the reason why I sort of grouped them all together is because they're really just, they're all saying the same thing. Rich people and yeah. big corporations have mm-hmm. have too much power over politics. Uh, but one of the points I made in that, in that response is, is that there, Reich and other people in the progressive left, uh, they don't see all of the distortions and unearned income that comes as a result of money printing. So like fiat money printing and central banking definitely causes the sorts of things that that they're decrying. So Reich is, is against all this undeserved income, but what else is Cantillon effects except for undeserved income where like you're just you just happen to be closest to the money printer, you get you get the the new money first and so you're able to spend it first and and then prices rise for everybody else that are, that's later on in the Cantillon effect chain. And so I and so that's why I refer to that as a blind spot for the progressive left is that it seems that they've picked up on something here. It's like I would agree with them. Yeah, there are some instances of undeserved income and wealth, but it's not because of the functioning of the market economy. It's because of all the things external to the market economy, namely the government that's you know causing things to be messed up. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. So maybe we can circle back and and explicitly uh, reinforce that point you just made there. Because yeah, what I wanted to get across was that the, the Misesian point, besides just pretty standard economic analysis of wage rates and things like that being tied to marginal revenue product, but like the entrepreneur, like why why is it that you know some people amass these great fortunes and they're um, and whether it's like a business founder, which is the you know the more conventional thing, or like an investor who's just really really good at uh, you know dabbling in stocks or whatever, and then you know just keeps growing his wealth over time. Um, you know what what is it there? The you know, me, the Mises would say, oh, it's somebody who more accurately forecasts the future, you know, financial conditions or at least some subset of them than his peers do. And that's what it takes to earn entrepreneurial profit. So in the context of a, of a business, yep, you look and you see how much the prices for various inputs are, and then you make forecasts about, well, gee, I could buy these inputs and transform them to goods and services and sell them to potential customers. And I imagine I could get such and such. And if there's a big enough gap there, then you go ahead and do it. And so, you know, the assessing and, and why would that gap exist? Why would there be this profit opportunity where you earn more even than the the you know implicit cost of the capital, like in terms of if you use it yourself, what could you have earned in other investments? Or if you borrow it from outsiders, what's the explicit rate of interest you got to pay on the loan? Why would that gap exist? Why would there be a margin for a pure profit opportunity? Well, it must be because either, you know, the rest of the world missed that opportunity. Otherwise it wouldn't have existed. It would have been bid away that the, the inputs would have, their prices would have been bid up and the outputs as more people got into that area, you know, would have pushed the prices down until that gap was, was eroded away. Right. And so that's the social function, if you will, like that's what you're being rewarded for. If you want to talk like that. So it's not that you worked harder, I, I guess, partly where it's coming from, maybe why Reich is, is thinking he's not attacking a straw man is I think it is true in the real world like if you go into a McDonald's, probably the shift manager is working harder than most of the teenage kids that are there. <laughs> and then beyond that, like the the franchise, is it E? <laughs> or, or I don't remember. I forgot how that word. But the person who's like business that is that if it if it goes under, like he might be out several hundred thousand dollars or something that he put into it. And he's probably, you know, when he first gets that thing up and running, he's probably working 80 hour weeks just to make sure everything is fine. And, you know, if somebody calls in sick, then he's got to show up because who else is going to do it? It's his, it's his business, his baby. Right. So I, there is that sense in which I think, you know, it is true probably that the people that earn more are the ones that other things equal are, are putting more into it, if you will. But strictly speaking, no, what you're getting paid for is results. And if, if, you know, it's a classic thing, like if, you dig holes and fill them back up again. Yeah, that's a lot of effort and labor hours, but no one's paying you to do that because it's not helping anybody. You're getting paid for the results. And so that's that's the thing. So the, someone who's earning a lot entrepreneurially, what is it that they're doing is they are correcting mispricings, if you want to talk like that, and that's what they're bringing. And so, yeah, other things equal someone who's always pouring over the financial data and you know, good does a bunch of research or whatever is more likely to do well there. But strictly speaking, it's not how much effort you put into it. It's did you better pick or did you better anticipate future conditions than your peers did? Yeah. One other thing that I'll add to what you just said, I totally agree, is that um, I, I think Reich uh, so operates under this assumption that wealth, it, it sort of replicates itself. That like once you are sitting on a big pile of cash, then you, it just sort of like grows and grows exponentially, almost mm -hmm. like at, automatically. Uh, but of course, it's not the case. So like the, the market economy is always changing. Uh, like if, you, if you're sitting on cash, that's a losing proposition these days because of inflation, price inflation, right? So, so a lot of them are, they have their wealth in, in investments and that, re that requires vigilance. That, that requires, uh, you know, making decisions about what they what businesses they think are going to do well, what consumers are going to want in the future, everything about, you know, future market conditions, they're having to constantly reevaluate and make new decisions and, and change investments. Uh, it's, it's not like, uh, like once you're just like sitting on this pile of wealth that it just automatically grows, it's like self-reproducing or something like that. Um, and I think he's missing that in his analysis. I mean, for obvious reasons, because that would, you know, totally mm -hmm. go against his conclusion. 
But uh, w- one point that he makes in this video is that um, I think he said 60% of all wealth is inherited. Yeah, he um, had a statistic. Yeah, I was going yeah, to. I, I, have, I haven't checked that statistic, but. or I don't like, think that can be right. Yeah, it, it just seems, <laughs> it seems high. Uh, but like if you connect that with what I was just saying, it, it means that you know, in order for that wealth to stay with the person who owns it, they, they have to keep putting it to good use. Like they have to keep making good choices or else, or else it'll just wither away or else um, they'll just lose it. So like, think about all the people who win the lottery and then they just blow it on a bunch of stuff. And um, you know, not to mention all of the social and relational issues mm-hmm. that come from that. Um, but, but, but my point is that you, you don't just, uh, you don't just get a bunch of money and then you're, set for life. Like if you want that wealth to grow, then you have to keep investing and and making those decisions with an eye towards what consumers are going to want in the future. Right. And I mean, it's cliched at this point to say, you know, there's a successful business founder who found creates an empire and then, you know, he hands it off to his kid who's okay. And maybe treads water or where, but then usually by the next generation, the thing just implodes because, you know, in, in many family businesses, just because that work ethic, right, uh, and just competence or whatever hasn't been passed along. And I think in a lot of those cases, it's sort of, you know, hard times create strong entrepreneurs and whatever that, the, the you know, some the, the son of immigrants or whatever and had to dodge fights in, in the school system and whatever, and then come out and drop out of college and support work out of his garage, like that kind of grit and determination for you to make your first million also lets you make your first 10 billion. Whereas if you grew up as the son or grandson in that empire where you've never had to worry because you knew, oh yeah, my family's loaded and you know, I'm, we have pool parties with movie stars and stuff growing up and that's just normal. That person might not be a risk taker among other things, or might just be coddled and, you know, entitled or whatever not be a hard worker. I keep coming back to the hard work thing. So, you know, there is some overlap there. So, you know, I think there is all that uh, to be truth in that. So yeah, there was the, the, that quote, he said, most important, he said, the most important predictor of wealth or income in the U S is the wealth or income of people's parents. And I, even that, I don't, I guess it depends what, what is the, uh, the set of all possible indicators out of which that's the best one, you know, cause to me, I think I could come up with a lot more specific metrics that would be a better predictor than what he just said. So, it's, you know, it depends what, what he's using. So, for example, I know Jordan Peterson, a lot of his lectures says, if you tell me somebody's IQ and um, attention to detail, um, then that that's uh, conscientiousness. That's the actual the, the trait that he talks about. So people who are high IQ and high, con- high on a conscientiousness, you know, scale – they tend to get paid a lot, right? And so I would think I would take that over. You know, if you if you had two people and one had high IQ and high conscientiousness, and the other one had low IQ and low conscientiousness, but you told me the second guy's parents made twice as much as the first guy's, I would still say by the time both those guys are fifty, the guy with the high IQ and conscientiousness is going to have more assets than the other guy. Would be my guess. You know, I haven't gone and, and tested that, but so I'm when saying when Reich throws that out, it's like yeah, if you mean what their GPA was, that's not as important as knowing how wealthy their parents were. Okay, maybe. But, you know, in terms of some, I can come up with other metrics. And just to give some counterexamples too, again, so Jonathan and I are both saying when Reich has that graphic that says 60% of the wealth in the U.S. is inherited, I I wonder what that's referring to. I just Googled richest people in America. I don't know. I think this is probably based on 2023 data. And it's Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Larry Ellison, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Michael Bloomberg, Steve Ballmer, Larry Payton. All right, so Musk, Bezos, and Bill Gates, they all, you know, formed company. you know, they're self-made men, right? They just formed things. I think Larry Ellison also was, was he's Oracle, I believe. I just checked him. He's, he's definitely, his parents weren't rich. He, like, came from a divorced family or something and grew up in a middle-class neighborhood. Warren Buffett... His dad, you know, was a somewhat powerful person, but it, you know, Warren Buffett certainly generated most of his current wealth, you know, during his lifetime. It's not that his dad just handed him stuff and Warren Buffett tended the store and kind of just tread water. That's not at all what happened. So it, it's simply like with a, with a Donald Trump or whatever, and people can quibble about, you know, how wealthy is he. But even people who 
uh, didn't start out. It wasn't that they grew up middle class or, or or lower, even people who grew up in the wealthy. But if then they took what their parents gave them and then increased it a hundredfold, still, that's it's not correct to say, oh, yeah, that wealth was all inherited. You can say they had advantages and things. OK, but again, it's it's that the advantage put them in a position to create more wealth, not that the advantage is literally the same thing as the wealth. Like they actually did have to go make it. So, you know, if someone's a great chef and his, his restaurant takes off and then he says, ah, yes, my father was an excellent chef and taught me everything I know. You could say, well, that's not fair, but you're still going to want to go to that guy's restaurant and not the (laughs) other guy who, man, he's a really nice guy. He really works hard. He gets up chopping vegetables at 4 a.m. every day but the food just tastes disgusting there. You're not going to keep going there. That's stupid. Yeah, I'm reminded of a point that I think Jeffrey Herbener made um, a few years ago. I think I was just I was uh, eavesdropping on a conversation he was have he was having with another student at Mises University, um, and the point that he made is that uh, capital markets globally, but also in the United States, are massive. And what that means is that really any anybody with a who thinks they have a good idea of how to make their millions, how, how to start a business and, and get it off the ground. Uh, no matter, no matter their starting position, capital markets are so huge and investors want to in, uh, invest uh, in promising business ventures uh, that really it like it's, I think it's true to say that like, anybody with, with that sort of determination that can, you know, signal to investors that I've got a great idea and I can bring it to uh, completion and make lots of profits for both myself and for the investors. Uh, it, it goes to show that it's uh, well, wealth um, b- might be passed down from generation to generation, but that doesn't exclude people from this this opportunity where they can also embark on their own venture and make their own millions if they have that idea, if they have that mm-hmm. foresight if they have the determination, all, all of those things that we've already discussed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, before I forget, so so good point, but just to tie it back to what you said earlier, so as we've just thought through more of the implications and like what, the, what a Misesian approach to this stuff is, you're right. It, it comes back to, you know, what does it mean to say, oh, someone's being rewarded because he more correctly anticipated future conditions if part of that means... Ah, yes, he knew that the Fed was going to do such and such, or, you know, he realized, oh, it's going to be good if I'm friends with Joe Biden, that'll pay off in 10 years. You know, you you could, in a sense, say, oh, yeah, so the reason that guy's wealthy is because he knew to, you know, be buddies with the the people in the Pentagon who were handing out the military contracts and so forth. 10 years might be a long time horizon for Joe Biden. Let's let's be honest. No, I'm saying (laughs) 10 years ago. Oh, you're saying 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, right. so people probably aren't saying that same sort of thing right yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, but Biden's not buying yellow banana or green bananas. Yeah. <laughs> um, so well, he's not buying yellow ones either. So okay, so r- right, that's so there there is that element here that when when we sort of say that oh yes, it's a it's a good th- you know there's a, a positive analysis right. Economics is value free. That was one of the things we stressed earlier, but. Reich is right that we can sit there and talk about the marginal product. And then there is this sort of thing that goes along with that, where it's kind of like, yeah, workers get paid according to what their contribution is in terms of marginal analysis. And then there's like, and so that's kind of fair, right? Like everyone's getting paid what they put in, in a, in a sense. And so, um, that doesn't, that, that fairness element or the, the moral legitimacy, if you will, doesn't work if what they're contributing to is something that is not voluntary and is socially destructive, right? So that that is the kind of thing. I mean, you could sit there and say the people who are shareholders in tobacco companies, I don't, I don't like that. But again, even there, he's saying, okay, sure, you could have your moral doubts about it, but what's going on is the consumers who buy the cigarettes like that product, and so that's what what's going on, and ultimately your problems with the consumers. But yeah, if there's some, you know, even just like a a, a pickpocket or something, you know, we, we wouldn't say that, Oh, the reason the pickpocket has more money than the kid working at the minimum wage job is because the pickpocket contributed to consumer satisfaction more. Cause, and that's why he has a higher revenue that no, he's just stealing from people. So there's, there is that element. You got to be careful that we're not saying anybody who's got a big bank account must have benefited society. There's other ways you can make your money 
outside of the free market. I mean, maybe that's the way of putting it, that all of this discussion about what does the, mar- the free market friendly economists say, we're talking about in a market, this is how things work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so like, as I mentioned, so you brought up the uh, the pickpocket example and I brought up the Federal Reserve. It, the same thing applies to like a counterfeiter. So like we wouldn't say that a counterfeiter's millions, right, are, is earned wealth. That's obviously, you know, that's fraud, that's taking purchasing power away from everybody else. Uh, and, and there's plenty of examples of that. So we don't live in a pure free market economy. So there's plenty of examples of that. Uh, going on in the United States, which I, which I think is the focus of uh, Reich's videos, uh, and, and so uh, you can see this as well in um, uh, net worth by zip code, <laughs> and it's sort of funny yeah, to yeah. see like right around Washington D.C. It's like the wealthiest counties, the wealthiest uh, uh, areas in the in the entire United States, and I'm I'm pretty sure it's not because you know they're making AI chips or they're uh, making anything that consumers value, right? It's it's because it's because they're they're at this they're right next to the counterfeiter and they're right next to the pickpocket. They're right next to the to this huge institution that is you know taking wealth from everybody else. And so obviously that's a huge example of what what I think anybody would consider as like unearned wealth and income. Um, but Reich doesn't seem to want to talk about that. He so he, he's sort of like directing his blame at the at the market. When it seems like the most egregious examples of this are the people who are right next to or actually occupying state power. Yeah, I mean, and if he had just been more nuanced, I would have had a problem with it. If he said that, yeah, the conventional apologists for the U.S. system, let's call it, treat everything like it's a voluntary transaction. But really, if you think about it, there's a lot of government hokey pokey or, you know, I would be okay with it. But you're right, that's that's not the way he's he's making it sound like capitalism is what we, you know, you and I would consider to be a highly interventionist system. And, you know, that's like, we, again, we're just, he's, he's mixing things. It's, it's hard to be, to keep it straight if he can't even, you know, say, ah, yes, we can imagine a genuine free market. And then well, how do you feel about that? Mr. Reich versus, you know, the current system. And then that, cause and part of the reason of doing that, it's not just a matter of, you know, being dogmatic and, you know, I can imagine someone saying, well, doesn't it matter what's going on in the real world, not in your, you know, your fairy tale, idealistic setting? It does matter, though. You need you need to know that because right now we can all agree we don't like the real world. Reich doesn't like it. Jonathan doesn't like it. I don't like it. But then to know, so what change should we make? You kind of have to know. Well, what would things look like if it were a market economy and very little government intervention versus way more government intervention? And so that's that's kind of the you know what you got to do in order just to know the two the two different outcomes could be or the two ends of the spectrum. Otherwise yep. you don't know what you don't know which way you want to go towards. Yeah, I I totally agree. Uh I wonder, do you want to um like look at some of the other yeah. myths? Let's, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So let's see here. It's well, I'm just making a timestamp. Okay, yeah. So here, folks, the other one we were going to cover is this number four about the myth is corporate donations are free speech. Robert Reich disagrees. Here's a bare-faced lie. Corporate political donations are free speech. Rubbish. That's not free speech, that's bribery. In 1971, Lewis Powell urged the leaders of American corporations to devote a portion of their profits to politics. Since then, America has witnessed the largest and most entrenched system of legalized bribery in its history. Big corporations and the super wealthy have rigged the free market for their own benefit. Throughout the 1980s, corporate PAC spending on congressional races increased nearly five-fold. Labor union PAC spending rose only about half as fast. By the 2016 campaign cycle, corporations and Wall Street contributed $34 for every $1 contributed by labor unions and all public interest organizations combined. In 1980, the richest one-hundredth of one percent of Americans provided 10% of all donations to federal elections. By 2012, they provided 40%. Both political parties have become giant fundraising machines fueled by money from the top. 
What's the result of all this bribery? Politicians use the money to get elected and re-elected, and then lawmakers do what corporations and wealthy individuals want. It's legalized bribery. Okay, so there we played a large, we probably played a larger chunk of this one, folks, just because the actual whole thing was very short. But what do you, what do you think, Jonathan? What's your initial reaction? So my initial reaction is is that I, I think that they've, once again, they've diagnosed something that that is an issue. Like, I, I do think that there is, like, too much, I agree with them that there's too much, like, big business and corporate control over politics um, and I would even I would even go so far as to agree with his terminology. I do think that there's uh, a good bit of bribery going mm-hmm. on so that these corporations can get the sorts of laws that they want um, to inhibit competition, to get subsidies, to get government contracts. So like my my main response here is that what's the root cause? Like what is actually why are businesses doing that sort of thing? And of course, the answer is because, the government has the ability to grant them those privileges. The government has the 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 money to to spend in in their direction, or has the power to regulate their their competitors, or in some interesting cases, regulate the entire industry. But the the company that's doing the lobbying knows that they're bigger and can actually handle those regulations better their better than their competitors do, and so they'll still lobby for those uh, regulations, even though it would those same regulations would be applied to them. So, so the root cause of all this is, is the existence and swelling of, of state power itself. It's, it, Reich's solution to this is to have centers of countervailing power. So like we want strong labor unions and we need minimum wage legislation and all these other things. Um, and so um, all that does is it, it just, it, I liken it to a, a hungry, hungry hippos game where he's just, you know, trying to get more people to, to grab their share of this like um, zero sum pie where everybody's trying to grab what they can get from the government. And of course the alternative view is that let's, let's constrain the government or get rid of the the state power that is offering those sorts of privileges to, to people who would come and and take them either through bribery or other means. Did you see the meme recently, the Hungry Hippos thing with the, with the James Bond? Did you see that floating around? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So for folks who didn't see it, just, this is, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But <laughs> there's a meme that recently has been making the rounds where it's the you know very clever, suave guy at the you know the casino with James Bond. And it just shows him. And then there's photoshopped a Hungry Hippos game on like the, the, you know, the, the table. And he says, ah, it appears your hippo is not as famished as you had led us to believe, Mr. Bond. <laughs> So, okay. I, back I, use, to I use hungry hippos a lot um, in class and in my other talks that I give uh, be, because I think it's just a good example that everybody can quickly grasp what a zero sum mm-hmm. view is or zero sum situation. Um, I also use it in uh, when I'm talking about business cycle theory uh, where like the interest rate is pushed artificially down and that doesn't actually increase saved resources. That doesn't increase our productive capabilities. I'll, all the artificial boom is, is just people mashing down on the levers faster, grabbing up the resources. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I haven't played hungry hippos in a while. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with what yours ticket, the way I, I would try to put my finger on what I liked and what I didn't like about his video there. So he's, he's, he's setting it up as, Oh, the myth is what we're hearing is that uh, corporate, donations are free speech, right? And this, and this harkens back to a, a court ruling this is saying as, as much, right. That, you know, if, if a, if a company, if a big corporation wants to spend more money on some ad campaign for some politician, the government can't come in and say, Oh no, that violates campaign finance laws. And you can't do that. Corporations can only, but they're saying, no, you can't do that because Hey, if, if the if the shareholders of this company want to spend their money talking about I like this candidate not this candidate or I think people should vote yes on Proposition 17 or whatever, how can you come in and limit their ability to say that? Aren't you? That's regulating their political speech, and that's clearly First Amendment protected free speech. And so Reich is trying to argue against that view and say no, it isn't because look at how much influence the corporation when a corporation spends millions of dollars you know, through a pack or whatever, or directly giving it to a candidate so that he can get his message out. And then that candidate wins the, the light, you know, the guy who has the more money has a huge advantage. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed to win, but clearly, you know, money helps in a political campaign. So then that person gets in there and then 
you know, repays the favor either explicitly or, you know, maybe perhaps through more subtle mechanisms, but that's, it's legalized bribery. And so I would say, you're right. That is legalized bribery, but still the solution is not to say, so therefore it's not protected speech and the government can regulate what comp what, you know, companies are allowed to spend their money on in terms of political ads. Like, so that, that's the disconnect. And the, the analogy I would use is say, um, suppose major newspapers and, uh, you know, TV stations and so forth have their anchors go out or the editorial staff says, yeah, we think on this upcoming election that people should vote for Biden. And you could argue maybe there's this, if Biden gets reelected, he's going to remember who had his back and there's some way that that's going to, you know, he's going to reward them for their wise decision to back him. And so that that could happen. And if you could point to specific examples, like where maybe, you know, there's the New York Times wants to merge with some other thing and they need approval to do so. And, the you know, the government goes ahead and gives the green light, whereas they wouldn't have if the New York Times had been a pain about, you know, something. New York Times maybe not, not a great one because they recently said Biden should step down. But that you get the idea that there's all kinds of regulatory things where if a company that's in the business of media, you know, news is is does what the people in power want they could be rewarded accordingly or they could be punished if they get out of line and so does that mean therefore is hey since there's legalized bribery anyway the government should come in and be able to regulate what newspapers say explicitly like no that doesn't follow at all it's still the case that the new york times editorial you know editorial staff can say who they think should win the election and who people should vote for and that is clearly protected speech even if they might use that in settings, because ultimately what's going on is what the problem, it's not people voicing opinions, it's that the government has the power to either reward or punish them. That's the issue. So the, the, the issue with bribery, like if a cop pulls you over to give you a speeding ticket and you try to give him $100 and say, hey, how about we just forget this happened? Everyone's like, gets mad at the driver. No, the issue is if the cop takes the money and, and doesn't give you a ticket because he, you, he took your money. That's a dirty cop, right? That's the issue. The fact someone's trying to pay it, you know, if as long as the police just never took the money, that wouldn't be an issue, right? So I always thought that was funny where, like, Congress is like, oh, please don't try to offer us money to do something corrupt because we might take your offer. You're a bad person for waving money in front of me. You know what I mean? It was just so weird that you could get in trouble for paying a politician to do something. Like, shouldn't it be the politician who's in trouble? You know what I mean? So anyway, that just, like, if you walked into a McDonald's and you were like, hey, in your 10th in line and you yelled at the kid at the counter, I'll give you 20 bucks. If you give me the next cheeseburger, I mean, I don't think you broke the law by doing that. Like clearly the right <laughs> thing is the kid behind the counter should say, no, I'm not allowed to do that. You know, <laughs> not that you should get punished because you tried to jump the line with a bribe. So, um, so, so anyway, my, my point being the worst of all outcomes here is what Reich wants, I believe, is to say, no, let's go back to a system or even have a more stringent where there's rigid limits because on what can be spent. Because then that clearly means the powerful people get to more closely determine who's going to win the election. Because at least under the old system, the, the, old, the loophole was someone who was personally wealthy could just finance his own campaign. And then, the, you know, the court ruling opened up the floodgates more. So, but that was always the ultimate check. And that, that's why, you know, Ross Perot and people like that were such formidable third-party candidates because they couldn't be stopped. You couldn't stop them with finance, campaign finance limits. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 the limits on that stuff benefit the oligarchs, not the little guy. Like, Reich seems to think, oh, yeah, the corporations love being able to spend. But no, the, the people who run the government, the deep state or whatever you want to call it, benefit from being able to control. So, oh yeah, even if some crazy billionaire comes on the scene, we can prevent him from even spending his own money to finance his campaign. They would love that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with your analysis. I'm also, I'm just always entertained by the examples that you come up with. I love, I love the McDonald's and the, and the cop and all that. So, so, um, one, one other thing that I'll mention here, uh, is that the, this is supposed to be a series on economic myths. And like, this is clearly not economics. Like this has mm -hmm. really nothing to do with like the functioning of a market economy, what, what people are doing when they're producing and consuming. This is, this is like just pure politics. It's just, it's, it's, it's not even 
politics per se. It's just it's just trying to like get people to have this sort of emotional reaction. It's just uh, I don't know. I don't have much more to say. It's yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe this is what you're getting at. When I heard that Robert Reich was launching a series where he was going to debunk ostensible economic myths, I was very excited. Oh yeah, because I yeah. thought, oh, this will be like Contra Krugman for a little bit. And no, he's just doing. He's giving us nothing. I mean, at least Krugman, especially when you know he was in his prime, he would have well articulated Keynesian polar opposite takes than what the Austrian take typically was on a given issue. And he would give his, you know, his, his reasoning, his economics and, and explain why the other guys are going to say this, but they're wrong. And at least, you know, it was okay for like two levels of analysis deep. Whereas Reich, it's like, he can't even accurately state what his other, the other side's opinion is. It just. Yeah. I, I remember I had that same reaction when I saw, I saw him announce that he was going to do a series of 10 economic myths. And I was like, great. Like here's some meat for me to bite into. Here's, here's like something I can, I can actually, you know, deal with and write about and, you know, do podcasts on. Um, and then the first one came out and even in the first one, I was thinking, is this really worth my time? Because it was, mm -hmm. it was just all the same sort of progressive left talking points, uh, not really like economic meat. And then it, like more came out and I just, <laughs> I was like, come on, this is, yeah. <laughs> this is getting so it, old. <laughs> it, it wasn't meat. You could stick your, it was more like breadsticks. And you're like, what is this? This, uh, you know, <laughs> stale right. breadsticks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I guess probably that's a good spot to, to wrap up at this point. Hopefully Reich will maybe give us better things to do, but I'm guessing all the videos, from he just keeps recycling the same diagrams of a, in a corporate spending. Oh, the other thing I'll mention, if you actually look at the statistics he shows, the spending is not as high as I would have thought. Right. Like in terms of how much do the, you know, does this group contribute to the, you know, campaign? Like they're not humongous numbers. And so, yeah, it was like, uh, and it was also an old date. So he, he had two dates. There was one in the 1980s where it was 10%. And then there was another one that was, I can't remember. Was it, was it, uh, 2013 or something? And it was up to a whopping 40%. It's like, I don't know. It seems, it seems like, well, well you're talking about the thing, but I mean, he had also a chart in there with like the absolute dollar amounts from these various lobbyists. And it was like the top one was 22.9 million or something. It was like, yeah, that's, that's yeah. nothing. I, you know, so, okay. All right. So we will wrap up there. As always, Jonathan, thanks for your uh, time and insights. Thanks for having me, Bob. And thank you folks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.